Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Mark Seifert, Healthcare and Life Sciences uh, Solutions Advisor for the Center for Professional and Executive Development. I'm excited to have you with us as we hear from Ann Martell. Before I introduce Ann, I'd like to share a few words about the Wisconsin School of Business and our Center for Professional and Executive Development, or CPED. Ann, if you want to go to the next slide. So CPED offers programs and certificates that will give you the modern, relevant skills needed to advance your career. All of our programs offer interactive learning sessions facilitated by instructors with practical business experience. We also partner with organizations to customize these programs and bring them on site to your organization. For more information on the center, please visit our website at uwcped.org. Next slide there. So today, um, as we go through the webinar, if you do have questions, you can submit those questions either using the chat or the Q&A buttons on the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, we'll pose questions that are submitted during the Q&A at the end of today's webinar. I also wanna mention that today's webinar is being recorded and a link will be uh, sent and made available within the next few days. So now, um, before I turn it over to Anne, I wanna give a brief intro. Uh, Anne has served as CFO and controller to a variety of organizations in the healthcare industry, including Anthem, WellPoint, Commonwealth Medical Group, Attic Angel Senior Community, the Wisconsin Best Breast Cancer Coalition, and Oakwood Lutheran Senior Ministry. In addition, as the Assistant Medicare CFO at National Government Services, one of the largest Medicare contractors in the United States, Anne had the opportunity to see healthcare from all different angles. Anne's also been a great resource and practitioner in many of our CPED programs, both in open enrollment and custom um, from the financial acumen standpoint. So we're excited to have Anne and thanks for being here with us, Anne, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Mark. And good afternoon, everybody. Greetings from, it's sunny, but don't let it fool you cold. It's cold, Wisconsin. Um, as Mark said, I am Ann Martel. Um, in my introduction that, that Mark shared with you, um, as you might be able to discern, I, I am an accountant. Uh, I did graduate from Wisconsin, let's just say many years ago with my accounting degree, and I have held a variety of different positions um, in the healthcare, health sciences, and health insurance industry um, continuum. So I have had the opportunity to see the healthcare system from those all of those different angles. And one of the things that as a, a CFO or as a director of accounting, one of my main missions is to always be able to not just produce financial statements, not just produce that, that scoreboard of what the business is doing, but my mission, my role in, in my various jobs was to help my fellow staff members, my fellow managers, my fellow leaders, my fellow individual contributors, help them understand the language of business. It's like learning a, a new foreign language because I have, have encountered so many talented people, whether it's the best director of nursing or a vice president of, of IT or a marketing and PR director, really good at their craft, but this language of business is just, it's kind of mystifying. It's, it's kind of, man, all these terms are different and I don't know what, what it means. And I really love this quote from um, the Harvard Business School. If you speak the language of money, you will be more successful. Finance is the way businesses keep score. And it's true in any type of industry, but it's especially challenging in the healthcare continuum, mainly because the focus and the mission of healthcare, whether it's I'm working in a hospital, I'm working in a clinic, I'm working in a senior living community, um, I'm working in an ambulatory surgery center. Your mission is to provide care and to provide quality care to your patients, your residents along the way. And so sometimes it seems like, oh, I'm a little uncomfortable thinking about money and business, but it's essential to be able to know how your business makes money. How does it measure performance? Because that's what's going to give you 
continued and sustainable growth and performance into the future, no matter what challenging times we're going through. I like to use the analogy of a bakery or a cupcake in this example. Now I want you to take your healthcare hat off and think like an entrepreneur for me for a second. Just think about you're starting your own business and you're gonna open this bakery and you're gonna make cupcakes. And that's one of your main products is you're gonna make cupcakes. Well, traditionally, what you wanna know as the business owner is, well, I, I know I'm gonna need some raw materials. I know I'm gonna need flour and eggs and butter and all the things that are gonna make a yummy, yummy cupcake. And I probably am gonna need a mixer, somebody to mix all those ingredients together and maybe a baker to bake everything and, and a decorator to decorate my cupcakes and make them all pretty that I, I, I can sell them. And then you have your entrepreneur hat on and you're thinking, well, what are, what are all my other costs or expenses of running a business? Things like rent or advertising or the accountant, you gotta pay the accountant or insurance, or licenses, or utilities, all these other expenses of running a business. And if, if you keep an entrepreneur hat on, you think like an owner, you usually go to the, hmm, what does it cost me to make that cupcake? Pretty straightforward. We'll talk about pricing in a little bit, but understanding your costs is one of the First, simple rules of business finance for anybody. You're going to purchase your materials. You're going to add value to those materials. And you need to know your costs. This is something that in the healthcare industry is, is pretty straightforward. Understanding the costs that it costs to run your healthcare facility, how much it costs to run um, an ambulatory surgery center. There's a lot of focus from your financial people on managing those costs, but there can also be a lot of questions there that, that we're going to get into in a, in a little bit. But knowing your costs is really important because then keeping our bakery example going, we want to sell our cupcakes. And hopefully if we understand what it costs us, not just our butter and our eggs and our flour and not just our, our baker and our mixer, but all the costs of, of running our bakery and making our cupcakes, including the accountant and the insurance and the utilities, if you know your costs, you want to be able to price your product at a level that is going to be above your costs because that's what keeps you in business. And then finally, the third step, the third basic rule of finance, whether you're a healthcare facility or not, or you're, you're an entrepreneur in your bakery, you have to be able to convert your sales into cash. You have to generate cash. Cash gives you the power to act. And if you don't have good cash flow, you're not going to be able to pay your people. You're not going to be able to buy any more materials. You're not going to be able to pay your rent. And you're going to be out of business pretty quick. Warren Buffett used to say, Give me a business that is not generating a profit, but they have good cash flow. There's cash coming in from, from their owners or their investors. I can run that business forever. But if I've got a business, even if they're really profitable, but I can't convert those profits into cash, we'll be out of business by the next payday. So cash is the, the important third rule of business. So from a healthcare perspective, what does that mean? Well, from a healthcare pers perspective, the rules still apply. You wanna make sure that you know your costs. So if it's looking at how much you're spending on medical supplies, things like IV bags and, and personal protective gear and gloves and drugs and all of those costs that you need to provide care, and then you have very talented staff that provide direct patient or resident care. That's knowing your costs. Know what it costs to run your business. The difficulty in healthcare 
is then where are you going to price and how are you going to price yourself to make sure that you're covering all your costs? It's different in healthcare, especially in a hospital clinical type of a, a scenario where different payers will pay you different reimbursement levels. So understanding what type of payer mix you have is an important function of understanding how your business makes money in a clinical setting. Now, ultimately, all of these things build up and your, your financial team, they're keeping score. They're, they're maintaining a scoreboard. And just like a baseball scoreboard or a football scoreboard, the accountants are keeping track of every transaction that's, that's happening within your business. And then they accumulate all these transactions in order to prepare a set of financial statements. And there are three main financial statements that I want to address before we get into understanding and building on what are some of the KPIs that are important for a health care system. The first is the profit and loss statement. It's also known as the income statement, the statement of operations, the statement of earnings. It can come under a variety of different titles, statement of activities, and it's all the same thing. It's all the same financial statement. This financial statement tells the very important story of what just happened operationally in your organization in your clinic, in your hospital, in your senior living community? What happened operationally? What type of revenue did you generate from the services that you provided? What types of expenses that you heard, incurred? And then ultimately, what types of profit or losses result from that? Now, I wanna take a step back here and I wanna address something that often comes up um, when I'm, I'm facilitating finance and accounting for non-financial professionals at CPED or I'm out at a client and, and we're talking about this P&L statement. And I'll always get the question, especially when I'm working with my health healthcare clients, well, wait a minute, Ann, my business is a non-profit. We are not for profit. Why would I care about a profit and loss statement? That's a really good question. And I've faced it from boards of directors at, at some of the nonprofits that I've worked at. First of all, profit, all that means is it's a difference between what type of revenue are you generating and what types of expenses you have. So how much am I selling my cupcake for? How many cupcakes do I sell? What's the price per cupcake? And then what are the costs of, of making and selling my cupcakes? That difference is called a profit. So profit in its truest sense only means I'm looking at the difference between my revenue and my expenses. Now, another word for profit is margin. You might hear the term margin, especially if you're in a nonprofit or not-for-profit. And margin is the same thing as profit. It's just looking at the difference between what type of revenue or funding are you generating in a nonprofit and what types of expenses you're incurring to run your business. There was a very, very um, famous nun. Um, she was the administrator of St. Mary's Hospital, which was the original founding hospital of the Mayo Clinic. And her name was Sister Jenna Rose Gervais. And you might have heard this quote. And the quote said that she made was, no margin, no mission. That's the one you hear, you hear that truncated quote quite a bit. And what it means is even in a nonprofit, even though you, your main mission may not be to generate a profit, like Microsoft's mission might be, if you don't have a margin, if you don't have a profit, you're not going to be in business very long to satisfy your mission. I, I think back to you know the COVID outbreak and in the senior living community, it was really, really important, the senior living communities that survived were the senior living communities that had a little bit of a cushion, had a little bit of a margin. Because the reality of senior living is your residents die. 
And if you've got a pandemic and you can't admit anybody else into your senior living community, if you don't have that cushion, you're going to be out of business. Now, the, the little known fact of Sister Gervais' quote is it's not just about no margin, no mission. The second half of her quote was, if you, if you don't have a mission, you don't have any need for a margin. You don't have any need for money. So the mission, even in a non-for-profit, is what's driving that need to have a margin or to have a difference between the revenue or the funding you're receiving and making sure it covers all your expenses. This leads us to our second major financial statement, the balance sheet. Now, the balance sheet is in the scoreboard vernacular. The balance sheet is simply looking at what do I have, who do I owe, and what's my equity or my owner investment? Think about a house for a minute. So at one point in time, when you buy a house, you might buy a house for $300,000. You put $20,000 down and you finance $280,000 with a mortgage. That's a balance sheet. That's all that it is. It's I have an asset. I have a house for $300,000. I borrowed. Who do I owe? I owe the bank. 280,000, what did I put into that house? I put $20,000 of my own money into that house. That's my equity at that point in time. That's all that a balance sheet is. It's a, it's a scoreboard of what's your financial position at a specific point in time. What do we have as a healthcare system? Well, we've got buildings. We have a lot of equipment. We have MRI machines and we have imaging you know, all sorts of ultrasound, and we have all these different lab pieces of equipment. And then we might have some debt. We might owe some of our, our vendors some money. Now, equity is a little bit different in a healthcare organization, especially if you're a nonprofit. Equity is not like you think about Microsoft. You think about, okay, you know, you got all these shareholders of Microsoft, and they've all bought shares of Microsoft stock. And it's pumped billions of dollars into, into Microsoft and gives them some cash in the bank to do certain things. They can buy buildings. They can develop products. They can do all these things with the cash that the investors have, have put into the business. You probably, if you're working in a nonprofit especially, um, you, you probably don't have any owners. So equity is a little different for you. Equity represents, it's called net assets. And it represents over time, have you been able to generate that positive margin every year? Or for the most part, you know, a cumulative positive margin since, since the beginning of time. And it helps you as an organization build buildings and buy equipment and, and, and do the things that you need to do to run your business. So the balance sheet's a little bit different, especially for those of you who are working in a healthcare system that's a nonprofit. Um, some of you may be working in a, in a healthcare system that is a, a partnership where some partners put in money or a corporation where you might have shareholders or it might even be, um, if you're a smaller clinic, it might be a family run clinic. Um, those are examples of, of equity is a little more traditional where it's, hey, what'd you, what'd you put down on your house? What did your owners put into the business? But for, for many, many healthcare systems, equity represents the net assets, the cumulative, since the beginning of time, margin that you've been able to generate, revenue exceeding your expenses over time. And then finally, the third financial statement is a cash flow statement. As I said, that third rule of business, you always want to be sure that you're generating cash. And so a cash flow statement is critical. It's a critical financial statement because it's looking at where is cash coming into my business? Where is cash going out? And it gives a true picture of your, your cash position at any point in time, because cash is, is very different than profit. Let me give you an example of this in a non-healthcare example. In the early days of Amazon, way back when, when Jeff Bezos was first developing this, this new concept, he spent 
billions of dollars developing the infrastructure that was needed in order to put Amazon's vision into practice. Now, obviously, now Amazon's a very, very profitable company. But in those early days, there are years and years and years of net losses on, on an income statement, on a profit and loss statement. How did they survive? Well, they had a lot of shareholders. They had a lot of owners putting money, putting cash into the business and keep pumping cash into the business. So you looked at a cash flow statement. And even though Amazon wasn't generating any cash from its day-to-day -day operations quite yet, they had a lot of cash coming in from lenders and from owners that kept them afloat until they were able to start turning a profit. So a cash flow statement is kind of like a, a summary of your checkbook, for lack of a better term. You know, you and I, I can, I can look at my bank statement and I don't have that many transactions. Businesses have thousands and thousands of transactions. So a cash flow statement simply, simply summarizes where the cash is coming and where it's going. So those are the three main financial statements that provide the foundation to starting to, to dig into and to understand some of the performance indicators and how do you measure performance in a healthcare system. So here's an example of, this is an actual um, profit and loss statement from a healthcare system. You'll see that patient revenue is, is top line on the income statement or the P&L. And then you've got all these contractual adjustments. This is where it comes into play where the payer mix is really important. How much private insurance do you have? How much Medicare insurance, uh, Medicare payments are you, you getting reimbursed for? What's your Medicaid payer mix? The state run program, you know, how much are you getting from the state? Those are all contractual adjustments. So what, what a P&L tells you and why it's prepared this way is it tells you overall, what are the total amount of charges? So if I'm a hospital, you know, every procedure that I did, every surgery that I did, every baby that I del delivered, every lab test that I ran, every imaging that I did, every physical therapy session that I did, what did I charge? What did I charge either my patients if they didn't have insurance or my providers, whether it's Blue Cross Blue Shield Anthem or Medicare? So the total amount of charges that result from the provision of health care. Now, those contractual adjustments reduce what you're ultimately going to get. But it's it's a focus when you're looking at a financial statement, a P&L for a healthcare system. You want to be able to kind of see that relationship. And it's why a lot of organizations will be really, really um, have a, a laser focus on what's our, what's our payer mix. You know, I'm at 40% private insurance and 20% Medicaid and the rest is coming from Medicare. That, that gives you that insight. Now, obviously, you've got to also, you know, you're going to have some charity or bad debt, um, things that you're going to write off, people that come in and have absolutely no insurance, you provide them care, and you may never get reimbursed for that. That's also a component of that. Now, some facilities will have um, also other, other income, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But when we're, when we're looking at the, the gross patient revenue and that relationship of what is the contractual adjustment, what's the payer mix, it leads us to the discussion of the revenue cycle. For a healthcare system, this is a really important area because it, it really is focusing on not just what are you charging for providing healthcare, but also what are you able to collect from your providers? And there's a lot of steps along the way that if you've got a bottleneck or if you've got, um, gosh, what we've all been struggling with over the last couple of years, turnover, new staff, it's hard to find people that are good at medical billing. You know, though that area, if, if you're in a healthcare system and you're struggling with some of those challenges, that can directly impact what type of revenue you're going to be able to, to um, charge and what you're ultimately going to be able to collect from your providers. So you start with pre-registration. You know, if you've got a really good pre-registration 
process and you're gathering all your, your data from your patients before they even get into your healthcare system, that's the first step along the way. And then they, they get there and you register them. You know, I go to Wapon Hospital and I'm registering for my mammogram and they're, they're making sure they have updated insurance for me and they're asking me all these questions and collecting all this information that they're going to need when they go and bill the provider. Capturing the charge, doing this, making sure that, I mean, we're all in the, almost all of us are in, this, in the environment now of electronic health records but making sure that we're capturing the correct charge, the right DRG code, the right billing code, and having the documentation to support that code is extremely important. Um, you know, I, I when I was working for a, a medical services organization and I first came in and I'm, I'm looking at all these individual doctors and they all had separate billing departments and there was this one physician and he was just billing everything at just simple visit, simple visit, simple visit, simple visit. And I'm like, why are you doing that? Well, you know, I don't want, I don't want the auditors to, to come after me. I don't want to, he said, you're, you're really selling yourself short. You know, if you've got documentation, have it and bill appropriately. You know, you're able to raise their revenue by, by 25, 30% in that particular example. So capturing the charge, important piece of this revenue cycle, making sure that once you've captured the charge and gotten it submitted, that Oh man, oh, here come the providers now. Why did you pay this? Uh, we want to see your utilization review. We want to make sure that, that you're, you're getting everything right. Make sure that utilization review is done. It helps you when the providers start to come back and want to recapture their charges. So capturing the charge, making sure you're using your utilization review system appropriately, coding appropriately, and then submitting the claim timely, accurately, is going to be go a long way towards maximizing your revenue cycle. Then it's a matter of getting the, the cash in the door, um, getting the, the money back from your payers. I remember back in the day when electronic records were, were relatively new. Medicare, with their big, their big cudgel, <laughs> um, this was early on when I was, was at the Medicare contractor, uh, we were offering, hey, if you start submitting your claims, electronically, we'll guarantee that we're going to pay you, we're going to reimburse you in 14 days. Of course, it doesn't mean we're never going to come back and try to reclaim our, our payments, which unfortunately happened quite a bit, but it was a way to really force a lot of, of providers to submit um, their insurance electronically, or sorry, their claims electronically. Insurance follow-up, you know, if you've done all the previous steps correctly, Ultimately, hopefully, <laughs> you'll have, um, oh, I won't say no problem with, with, <laughs> with the payers, but rel you know, you'll be able to, to be able to uh, kind of go for, for appeal, go after the, the recoups and, and things like that um, if you've got good documentation on the front end. And then ultimately, a newer piece of the revenue cycle is getting money from the patients. Since we're now in the age of high deductibles and high um, co-pays, things like that, uh, maximizing your patient collections has become an important part of the revenue cycle. So you can see at any point in time, there's a lot of things that you could get bottlenecked or you could do really, really well. The revenue cycle is an important piece of determining how, how profitable or what your performance is going to be. Ultimately, in healthcare, remember the old cupcake example. Well, let's say you determined your cost of your cupcake was two dollars, and you want to set your price at three dollars per your cost, three times your cost. Sorry, three times your cost. So six bucks. You're running your bakery. I come in and I say, "Hey, I want that cookies and cream cupcake." Okay, that'll be six bucks. Mark comes in and buys that same cupcake. I want that cupcake. Six bucks. That's how traditional non-health systems work. Health providers, health systems, whether you're a clinic, ambulatory center, hospital, yeah, uh, hey, I'm Ann from Anthem. Um, you know, I want to buy that cupcake. Oh, well, Ann, for you, it's six bucks. Okay, here comes Medicare Mark. Medicare Mark comes in, and Medicare Mark only pays 
$2.10 for that cupcake, or maybe even a buck 95 for that cupcake. This is the whole crux of pay or mix. And you can have the best revenue cycle and no bottlenecks and very well documented and all the coding is done correctly. But your pay or mix, if you're heavily skewed to Medicaid and or Medicare, that's another area that is um, a, a key performance indicator that finance teams always look at because it really can drive your performance is your pay or mix. So revenue, one last thing about revenue cycle management before we move on to additional KPIs. Um, July of 2023, some, some recent data, um, hospital finances are, are not looking great. Um, it was a Coffin Hall report that was done back in 2023. And then again, there was a flash report that was issued on August 28th. The, the operating margin index, so your operating income, what that means on a profit and loss statement is you're looking at all your revenue that you're ultimately going to earn after all those contractual adjustments minus all your operating expenses. That gives you your operating income or your operating profit. It was 1.3% in July, 1.4% in June. So it's, it's inching downward. But anything in the 1.3 to 1.4%, that's a razor thin operating income margin. If things go just a little bit off the rails, you get a bottleneck in that revenue cycle management, your payer mix changes by 2%. Operating expenses that we're going to talk about in just one second, operating expenses bump up. Good, good grief, you know, staff costs are, are constantly going up right now in healthcare. Supply costs are going up, transportation costs are going up. All those pressures on operating income have made it very, very difficult in the healthcare environment to, to maintain performance. Um, compounds by bad debt, by charity care, um, revenue cycle management technology, approximately 75% of healthcare systems across the company or country are using it. We're also starting to see a lot of using artificial intelligence in both revenue cycle management and some of our payer mix strategies um, that we could spend a whole uh, a whole hour on artificial intelligence in the healthcare industry, but it is starting to be utilized in conjunction with revenue cycle management to really try to maximize um, the the revenue cycle for an organization. So back to the P and L. One last thing: let talk about other income. It can be donations, can be investment income, but expenses, operating expenses. Labor and benefits are usually going to be about 60% of your, of your expenses. Medical supplies are the next highest percentage. Administrative costs, compliance costs, all of those things are expenses of managing a healthcare system. But labor and benefits definitely is a, a huge area. This is also an area that has been ripe for looking at different ways, different ways, especially to use technology in order to try to reduce labor costs. I'll give you an example from a senior living community. Um, a senior living community that I was working with once, I was looking and, and working with them and the good old Fitbits or smart watches, Apple watches that we wear have become a, a really good piece of technology in senior living because a smart watch can tell you if one of your residents hasn't moved for a period of time or if they've fallen in senior living that's the biggest cause of healthcare challenges is falls so if somebody falls in their room in their assisted living apartment you want to know about it and rather than having labor certified nursing assistants, LPNs, or even RNs going around and checking on people, maybe you can use technology. There, I, I went to a trade show once, there are toilet seats that do your analysis now, <laughs> believe it or not. So just this utilization of technology um, is a, an area that is important in healthcare providers in order to try to keep these expenses down and try to manage the staffing and labor 
shortages that we are all seeing. So I want to I want to make sure that we get to measuring performance at your organizations. So in the last 15 or so minutes that that we're going to be talking together, managing performance at your organization is taking all of the data that maybe has been summarized on a financial statement or you know obviously one of the things that has been beneficial with electronic health records is not only are you capturing the, the data that you need for submitting, um, submitting your claims submissions, but you're also gathering a lot of data on just the operations and performance of your business. So utilizing that data to generate some, some key performance indicators um, is an important aspect of really getting the bang for, for the buck out of your electronics health, electronic health record systems. Now, traditional KPIs in healthcare um, usually, usually are, are founded in one of these four major categories. There are patient care KPIs, so your quality KPIs, um, some of your CCAPs, like the, the um, customer satisfaction types of thing, um, you know, how satisfied are your patients, how are they satisfied with their care, uh, readmission penalties from Medicare, all of those things are indicators of patient care. So there's a ton of key performance indicators there. There are facility management KPIs. How is your facility being run? Maybe it's it's average wait times. Um, you know, your management KPIs are looking for places that you might have bottlenecks in some of your processes in some of your um, operational procedures. If you have um, your hospital and your discharge procedure is is slow, well, that that has a downward impact on having that bed available for the person who's sitting in the emergency department waiting to be admitted. If you've got a bottleneck in your discharge process, then you've got a bottleneck down in ED, in the emergency department. So facility management key performance indicators are the ones that are focusing on how, how is the flow, how is patient flow through my organization, as well as facility management things can be things of um, some of the more sustainable types of, of KPIs that we're starting to see now, um, carbon footprints, um, utility costs and, and green um, initiatives that that you've been implementing, you know, using the the different types of light bulbs or what have you, and, and what can that do? Staff performance KPIs. Um, this is a, an indicator of you know how well is your staff performing, but it's also they are used to indicate how engaged is your staff. The the highest cost right now in expenses, as I just stated, will be your labor and your benefits costs. Labor costs, I'm not just talking about what you're paying the people that work for you. It goes way beyond that into exploring what's the cost of turnover at your organization. I'm gonna put my senior living CFO hat on when I was the CFO at Attic Angel. And I remember when I started there, we had a, our turnover rate, um, we were lucky if people stayed a year. Our turnover rate was in the mid 30 percentile, 30%, almost 40%. And I remember driving down to the Beltline in Madison and seeing this huge Quick Trip sign. Wow, come work for Quick Trip. We'll start you at $13 an hour. And I'm thinking, holy Hannah, our CNAs that we hire, were hiring at the time, we were starting them at $12 an hour. So, you know, senior living is tough. Do you want to come and, uh, and you know work at the dementia unit, memory care unit, and senior care? Or do you want to go and ring somebody out and say, see you next time, and get a dollar an hour more? So it's, it's beyond, obviously, pay adjustments were needed. But we also approached it by looking at how to reduce turnover. What can we do to reduce turnover? And then the third prong of our approach was how do we build the pipeline, build the pipeline of not just CNAs, but all of our other certified um, 
positions, whether it's an LPN or an RN. So looking at not just what you're paying, and I know that's top of mind for so many organizations of gosh, gosh, you know, wages, wages, we've got to compete, we got to compete. And we're hiring bonuses and retention bonuses and, and, and all that goes along with that. But the cost to have to hire somebody, the cost of turnover is equally important. So if you if you can also manage that, that's a, a, a key performance indicator from a staff perspective. And then finally, financial KPIs, operating margin, the 1.3% the to 1.4%, there's a lot of financial KPIs. So traditionally, what you see, um, operational and financial KPIs in a healthcare system, you, you see a lot of average length of stay, all right? Average length of stay, how long are they in the hospital? This is a great operational measurement, operational KPI, but it's also really general. So if you're in a large hospital system and you're just looking at big picture average length of stay, it's going to skew, it's, it's just not going to give you great information. So you may need to, to dig a little bit deeper because obviously somebody who's recovering from a heart attack is going to have a different length of stay type of a situation than somebody who's given a healthy birth to a very healthy baby and you know might be discharged within 48 hours. So average length of stay, good operational, key performance indicator, but one that has to be taken with a grain of salt. Same with bed or room turnover. You know, how, how long does it take you to turn over a bed? You really need to marry this one with readmission penalties. How often are your patients getting readmitted? Because obviously you don't want to turn somebody over. You don't want to discharge somebody before they're ready to go home. And are not just from a health perspective, but even a social work perspective, if, if they've had a stroke. You know, are you ready to discharge them from the hospital to home? Um, do they have the infrastructure at home to be able to help them? Or are they going to be back at your facility within 24 hours and you're going to get dinged for a readmission? So bedroom turnover, good KPI, but has to be married um, to readmissions. How do you utilize your, your medical equipment? How many MRIs do you need? You know, are, are you utilizing, you know, how many scans are you doing on each of your MRIs or each of your imaging machines? Do you have a, a piece of equipment that's not being used at all? How many wheelchairs do you need? Um, uh, am I going to go to the third floor in your, in your facility and open up a closet and there's like 15 wheelchairs in there? Oh, I didn't know these were in there. We just, wow, well, we just placed a purchase order for 15 more wheelchairs. So understanding where your medical equipment is and how are you utilizing it. Average patient wait time. Um, those are those are operational indicators of maybe there's a bottleneck somewhere. Financial KPIs that that you see a lot. Medical supplies as a percentage of revenue. You know, managing kind of like the how many wheelchairs do you need? How many gloves and adult diapers and IV poles and and protective gear and masks? You, know, you want to keep that that percentage pretty low unless you're going into a pandemic. Then you want to go from just in time to just in case and, and maybe build a warehouse and, and stock up on some of those personal protective gear. Seriously, though, it's, it's finding that sweet spot, not spending and investing and tying up all your cash in a bunch of supplies that may go bad, may walk out the door, you may forget about, may waste. Trying to find that, that, that spot because that's the second major operating expense, second to labor. Um, your average treatment charge, what, is it, what does it cost you um, to do a, a hip replacement, a knee replacement, to, to do a heart valve um, replacement, cardiac catheterization, deliver a baby? All of those, those things are, are important. This is the rule number one, know your charge, know your cost. Um, cost per discharge, can you, can you speed up your discharge process? Operating cash flow, where's your cash coming from? Or do you have, this is a, a um, result of perhaps a, a problem in your revenue cycle. If you're not getting the cash that you're thinking about, I'm billing $2 million and I'm only collecting 500,000 in cash, there's something wrong. Um, accounts receivable turnover, same thing. How long is it taking our payers to pay us? So there's, there's tons of different traditional KPIs understanding what makes the most sense 
for your organization is where the challenge is. This is a dashboard, an example of a dashboard that I had with one of my clients. And it's a pretty typical dashboard that I see a lot. Man, there's a lot of numbers on here. Oh, it's Excel based and it's so pretty and it measures just about everything that moves gets measured. But is it helpful? What KPIs are most significant to your organization? Narrowing it down can really improve the performance of your organization. So here's another example. This was one of my clients um, that I was working with. And this was their dashboard. And there's only six things on there. These were the things that they wanted to focus on in a particular year. And it, it changes, you know, every year or so they, they look at it. Is our average charge by DRG code or number of readmissions or um, length of stay, uh, patient types, you know, ED, inpatient, outpatient. These were the important measurement KPIs for that organization. Very straightforward. Everybody knew what they were measuring. Everybody knew how they, they fit in and how they impacted these, these types of key performance indicators. This is another one of, of um, that kind of is a mix between the two. It's a little, has a little bit more um, detail in it, but it's, I, I think it's a good one, number of um, total patients, but it really does look, look at admissions by division. So it's looking at the healthcare system and seeing where the major parts of their business were coming from. Um, it also incorporates how the patients feel their, their um, customer satisfaction with their, their treatment plan, which is way over to the right. If you're looking at this um, uh, right justified, left justified, uh, it has the wait times in there, has some different staffing, available staff per division, looking at your oper or oper operational costs per, per patient, and then average patients seen by doctors per month. So just two examples these last two examples are examples of healthcare systems that I've worked with where they have been focused on looking at the key performance indicators that align best with their mission. Now, there are some things that are on the horizon um, before we, we finish up and, and I ask for any Q&A. Um, two things that, that are really kind of hot buttons in the industry right now Sustainability in healthcare has been around for a while, and I'm seeing a lot more organizations using sustainability measurements as, as key performance indicators for their organizations. Um, it, the, the principles of sustainable clinical practice, um, I, I, I love this diagram from the sustainable physician because it really gets you thinking beyond Oh, let's reduce the carbon footprint. Let's let's put solar panels on top of the hospital and reduce our utilities cost. Um, low carbon initiatives, yeah, definitely important. But empowering your patients to take a greater role in managing their healthcare, leaning up your your delivery process, those are also ways to reduce your footprint and to become sustainable um, within a healthcare organization. And lastly, health equity. This has been a, a hot topic that has come up looking at achieving the highest level of care for all people. So trying to avoid inequity in healthcare access, um, healthcare treatment, um, especially those who have been in traditionally underserved or disadvantaged um, populations whether it's the difference between metropolitan healthcare systems versus rural, whether it's based on demographics, um, you know, as my, my work that I've done with the Wisconsin Breast, Care, Breast Cancer Coalition, looking at the inequities between the African-American population, having a much higher death rate from breast cancer than non-African-Americans, you know, social and, and health equity is looking at making sure that all populations have that access to, um, to healthcare. So this is a, a, I apologize, I thought I had the, the reference on this, but these are some different ways that healthcare equity initiatives um, can be implemented in a healthcare system. Um, you know, making sure you're using those data, 
to track patient outcomes, not just overall outcomes, but outcomes by race, ethnicity, language, to just identify, do you have disparities in your own system? You can't start working towards health equity if you don't know where you're currently at. Um, improving access, increasing the diversity within your, your leadership and your workforce, and then screening and, and looking for social determinants of health care and health um, the healthiness of your, your population. So time for Q&A. Mark, do we have any questions that have popped up during our time together? You will have to unmute yourself, Mark, because I can't hear you. Uh-oh, still not hearing you. I'm going to take a peek in the chat. Oh, Mark's having trouble. Okay. Uh, to get us kicked off, Anne, maybe you could tell us, um, you know, I don't understand the whole capital expenditure discussion at my oh, office. Why is good it question. And what is the difference good, between good. capital and operating? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so capital, there, there's all sorts of expenses of running a business. So when we talked about the the cupcake example, you know, we got we got the materials, we got the people, we got advertising. We also probably have to have a building, and we probably have to have um, ovens and pieces of equipment. Healthcare, same thing. You know, you got people, you've got medical supplies, but you've got these big MRI machines, and you've got testing machines, and you've got beds and wheelchairs and bariatric wheelchairs and all that stuff. So they're all expenses of running a business, but accountants put them into two different buckets, operating expenses and capital expenses. Operating expenses are considered any expense that you're using this year to run your business. So that I got to pay the wages of my nurses and my docs. I got to pay my advertising. I got to pay the lighting bill. That's for this year. That's an operating expense. A capital expenditure is an expense for something that you're gonna use in your business for more than a year, okay? So you're gonna use it for a longer period of time, three years, five years, a building, you know, 30, 40 years. And it has a significant dollar amount. And that that dollar amount, that, that term significant, will be different depending on the size of your business. You could have a very, very small clinic where a thousand bucks is significant to you. Or you could be part of a multi-conglomerate healthcare system where 50,000 is significant for you. So whatever that is set, you know, your finance people set that. But if you're going to use something, a piece of diagnostic equipment, you're going to use it for more than a year and it's got a significant price tag. That's called a capital expenditure. So an operating expenditure that shows up and that gets reported on an income statement Whereas a capital expenditure, that gets reported on the scoreboard that is the balance sheet. And a process called depreciation is what treats that or spreads that cost of that diagnostic equipment over the life you're going to use it. And that depreciation is what actually shows up on the P&L. This is a huge, huge uh, portion when we do finance and accounting for non-financial professionals, that that's a, a really big question. So that that was excellent. Thank you, Brooke. Anything else? So we got a question submitted. What are you seeing providers doing to build capacity in anticipation of increased patient usage that is generated from equity initiatives? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, you know, building that that capacity. Um, as you're, you know, if one of your goals is to, to really address the health, health equity issues in your, in your areas. Um, obviously, that's going to mean, hey, I've got to have more, more people to run tests. I've got to have more clinical staff. I've got to maybe have more doctors to be able to handle that increased capacity. And a lot of times, this is where you see um, some of the healthcare systems that are, you um, the bigger healthcare, I mean, be honest, the bigger healthcare systems that that maybe have a little bit more in, in the piggy bank, that they're going to be able to invest in some of the technology that 
can provide some of that 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 care. Um, we saw it a lot during the pandemic with the the quick pivot towards virtual healthcare. You know, some of your larger systems that were able to incorporate that relatively easily. They they had the technology um, and the capacity available to do virtual medical visits. Um, they were able to increase their their capacity that way. So it, it, where it's the real challenge is more the mid-level market um, where you may not have a lot of free cash flow to, to be able to invest in that, but, but using AI, using virtual um, visits, um, you know, being able to do and, and take advantage of some of the advances that we've been seeing in self-screening, um, those are some of the ways that um, I've been seeing some organizations increase their capacity level to be able to um, to address those, those types of issues. We got a question that just came through with, could you give some guidance into embedded leases and how to work through this for equipment or supplies? I'm hearing that the rules have changed and it will require more discussion and discretion as it may need to be put into the asset or onto the asset book. Wow, another really great question. And this is true. It used to be, it used to be that if you leased a piece of equipment, it was an operating expense. So let me give you a perfect example of this. You know, Roche Diagnostics is selling their diabetes testing equipment to a lab in a hospital. And they give the equipment away for free. You sign a lease that you're going to buy all the reagents and test strips and everything from, from Roche. So the Roche salespeople, they're, they're dealing with the lab manager. Hey, this is what it's going to cost you this year and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's an operating expense. Well, now all of a sudden the accounting rules have changed and says, you know what? That's not really an operating lease. You've actually bought a piece of equipment. So you're going to have to determine what's the embedded value of that diagnostic um, testing machine that you're selling to this healthcare organization. And that's going to have to be treated as a capital expenditure. And then all, ever, all the other stuff, the reagents and the test strips and all that, that can still be lab expenses. But the, the piece of equipment itself, even though you're leasing it, we're still going to treat it like a capital expenditure. And it, it's changed the whole um, kind of outlook in healthcare. It makes it much more difficult because all these pieces of equipment that you've been leasing now have to be treated as capital expenditures, they have to be tracked, they have to be depreciated, and um, it's it's a much different story. So um, I know we're getting short on time. I, I could spend, again, another two hours on, on that. Finance and accounting for non-financial professionals. There's, <laughs> there's my shameless plug. <laughs> I think we have time for just one more question and um, it, it might be a doozy. What are the top two to three areas you see AI having an immediate impact for healthcare, either clinically or operationally? Ah, boy, that is a doozy. Um, let me think off the top of my head very quickly or I'm going to tap dance until one o'clock. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, artificial, intelligence, artificial intelligence, it's being used, obviously, um, one of the key ways it's used is from the human resources side. There's a lot of artificial intelligence and pre-screening of applicants to try to reduce the, the time it takes to hire somebody. So artificial intelligence has actually been used for quite a while to screen out potential applicants and things like that. Um, the second thing that artificial intelligence is being used for, um, a lot of diagnostic things, reading images, um, reading lab tests, things like that. Um, it's being used, you know, and then prescribing treatment for the, the clinical thing, it's being used for that. And then finally, um, you know, in the in the discharge process, using artificial intelligence uh, from a hospital perspective, when you get those discharge instructions, you know, a lot of artificial intelligence is being used to generate those, those types of things. Those are the three main ones that I've seen so far. The sky's the limit on AI. Um, it'll, it'll be very interesting to see where that, that goes in the future. There, I did it. <laughs> thank you, Anne. I think we've got one more slide here. Um, thank you, everyone, you for attending today's webinar. Um, before we wrap up, I do want to let everyone know that CPED is ready to help everyone and your teams, your organizations, further develop business and financial acumen. Um, 
Mark would love to set up a discovery session to talk with you um, about consulting, coaching, or custom professional development programming. And did mention our finance and accounting for non-financial professionals program with our open enrollment. We also offer that in custom. Uh, Mark's email is on this slide here. Um, and feel free to reach out to him to set up a, a session to explore different opportunities for you and your organization. Uh, thank you all again for joining us. Thank you, Anne, for um, our, our presentation today. And we hope you all stay warm if you are in a chilly climate right now and uh, have, a, have a fabulous day.